This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether it's your new profession or just a lifelong passion, start your journey to website glory with Squarespace. Check out their awesome all-in-one platform through the link in the description below. More on them in a bit. During the first half of the 19th century, London's population grew faster than it ever had. By 1860, the city's population had risen to almost 3.8 million people, making it not only the most populated city in the world, but also one of the most crowded and dirtiest urban locations you were ever likely to see at the time. The small, cramped streets were overflowing with carriages, horses, street sellers, pickpockets, mounds of rubbish, human and animal excrements, and because we're all talking about the UK after all, plenty of rain and Reduced mud. Britain may have been flexing its colonial muscles, but its capital was straining against such rapid expansion. With chaos on the surface, there was only one place a new transportation system could go, and that was, of course, underground. What opened in 1863 may have been just a fraction of what we call the London Underground today, but it revolutionized urban transportation and forever changed modern metropolises. The success of the London Underground led to countless other systems being introduced in cities around the world, and as of 2021, there are roughly 185 finished underground systems across the globe, with several more nearing completion. As our lives have increasingly been boxed together in modern megacities, underground railways have become almost the standardized system for reducing congestion on the surface. And it all began in 1863 with a six-kilometer stretch of line known as the Metropolitan Railway. But before we jump back to the Dickensian squalor that was London in the early 19th century, let's have a look at the modern underground system, commonly known as the Tube. London's underground system today spans an area that sprawls much further than the traditional and always expanding boundaries of the English capital. The entire network spans around 400 kilometers, but interestingly, only 45% of that is underground. Today, the Tube covers 270 separate stations, 11 of which lie outside the Greater London area and spread across its 11 lines. On a normal working day, pre-pandemic of course, it would have a daily ridership of about 5 million people. And all of its trains combined travel around 69 million kilometers each year, which is around halfway to the sun. It may not be the biggest, newest, or most reliable underground system in the world, but it is arguably the most iconic. This is a sprawling story that covers over 150 years and is still ongoing today. So, well, we're just going to have to cherry pick some of the key points here, but we're sure it's going to be an enjoyable ride. <laughs> The early 19th century saw the beginning of what has come to be known as the Pax Britannica. This translates as British peace, a lauded name that indicated a relative peace between major European nations, but with Britain continuing its role as colonial dominator-in-chief across the planet, the word peace was a bit of a stretch. Riches brought back from the empire poured into Britain, particularly London. The city was booming, and by around 1825, it had overtaken Beijing as the most populated city in the world. But if you've ever been to London, you'll know full well that space comes at a premium, and this was exactly the same 200 years ago, although the size of the city itself was much smaller. By 1850, there were seven major railway terminals in the city, and there had been murmurings about building an underground system in London for at least two decades. But considering how normal we consider at the Tube today, back in the mid-19th century, this was a dangerously radical idea. One plan, which had been backed by the city in 1852, fell through because of a lack of interest from railway companies. Not only did many think it would never succeed, but most doubted the idea could ever be profitable. In 1854, the Metropolitan Railway was granted permission to build the first underground railway between Farringdon Street and Paddington, two bustling railway stations. The cost of construction was estimated at a million pounds, which is 142 million pounds today, though because of the ongoing Crimean War at the time, the company initially struggled to raise the funds needed and construction on the line did not begin until March 1860. Today, boring drills can chew through the ground beneath the city with relative ease and with minimum disruption, but things were far from that simple 
Hall was the world's first underground railway. Much of the Metropolitan Railway was created using a system called cut and cover, a technique where a trench was cut into the ground, then eventually covered by a supporting roof. Between King's Cross and Paddington, a large trench 10.2 meters wide was excavated with brick retaining walls eventually added along the entire route with elliptical brick arches or iron girders spanning 8.7 meters covering the top of the trench. As you can imagine, you can't exactly do this when there are buildings above, and most of the earliest sections of the London undergrounds were built beneath existing roads. From King's Cross, the line passed through a 666-meter-long tunnel under Mount Pleasant in Clerkenwell before finishing with an open cutting, meaning the line was not underground but had raised banks on either side near Smithfield Meat Market in Farringdon. The work was done almost exclusively by hand, though an early conveyor belt system was used to shift vast bounds of earth. Inside the trench, two railway lines were laid, with a gap of 1.8 meters between the two. By November 1961, the Metropolitan Railway had commenced trials, and in May 1862, a group of visiting dignitaries became the first people to travel through the system. The line made stops at Paddington, Edgware Road, Baker Street, Portland Road, Gower Street, King's Cross, and Farringdon Street, and it officially opened to the public on the 10th of January 1863. Any doubts that remained over the railway its financial potential quickly evaporated as it was an immediate and enormous success. On the first day alone, the system carried 38,000 passengers, and a total of 9.5 million passengers traveled on the Metropolitan Railway in the first year. Yet while it was certainly popular, it was a far cry from the modern system we see today. Passengers were transported via gaslit wooden carriages hauled by steam locomotives, which meant you often exited the system coughing and smelling as if you had been sat next to a bonfire for several hours. Lovely. In 1869, the type of coal used was changed to the smokeless Welsh variety, which helped, but it remained far from a sedate experience, so kind of pretty much like rush hour today. <laughs> The success of the Metropolitan Railway meant that there was no shortage of plans for further lines. The first to get going was a line that would eventually become the District and part of the Circle Line, although back then it was referred to as the Metropolitan District Railway. Roughly speaking, this would be the southern section that would link up with the existing Metropolitan Line to the north and create an inner circle in the city. Well. That was the plan. Due to a combination of high construction costs and compensation payments and a later dispute with the Metropolitan Railway, who operated the trains when the line opened and took 55% of gate receipts, the construction of the Metropolitan District Railway was a hard slog. But slowly, things took shape, with a 7.6 meter wide and 4.8 meter wide deep cut and cover tunnel along the majority of the route, although west of Gloucester Road was open cuttings to help with ventilation. On Christmas Eve 1868, the first trains began to run from South Kensington to Westminster with stations at South Kensington, Sloan Square, Victoria, St. James's Park, and Westminster Bridge. This section of the line, roughly two-thirds of the whole line when completed, cost £3 million, about £347 million today, nearly three times that of the entire Metropolitan Railway. The line eventually terminated at Mansion House in 1870 without connecting to the Metropolitan Line. By this point, the two underground lines had a major falling out. As I mentioned, when the District Railway opened, it was serviced by trains from the Metropolitan Line. The huge cost of construction meant the new line was already struggling, and with what they considered an unfair division of gate receipts, they soon rebelled and decided to run their own services. This led to a spat that wasn't ironed out for another 20 years. And speaking of rebelling and running your own services, well, who are you going to go to when you want to start a new website for your brand or business? Well, you already know the answer is today's sponsor, Squarespace. Now more than ever, people are getting creative with their time. They're looking to start businesses or blogs, things like that, on the interwebs. And that's where you must use Squarespace. It's the perfect web tool to help fashion your site into whatever you want it to be. When you're ready to get started on a new web project that you've been dreaming about, you gotta do it with Squarespace. One, they've got beautiful templates. So if you don't know a lot about design, I don't myself, I always use a template. Well, that's perfect. They look great, you go in, you customize, easy. Or two, if you're more of a design-oriented person, you're like, I know how to make things look good. Well, you can also use Squarespace to do that because it's fully, really in-depth customized. And once you're done making your website, there's a whole lot of extra stuff you can do. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support. It is all there. So when you're ready to get started on the next web project of yours, big or small, if it involves a website, it's got to be with Squarespace. Right now, you can go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com forward slash megaprojects to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And let's get back to the underground. As 
As much as we'd love to regale you with the details of each line extension, we'd be here for an extremely long time as a lot was going on in the final decades of the 19th century. So we'll try to motor through just a few of the most important ones. First up, we had extensions to both the Metropolitan Line and the District Railway, with both expanding east and west with several track offshoots appearing. But on top of this were a flurry of new lines. In 1868, the Metropolitan and St. John's Wood Railway opened and quickly expanded northward to bring places like Hempstead Village into the line and eventually reaching as far as Buckinghamshire. It was, however, back within the hustle and bustle of central London that the underground began to reach new depths with the introduction of deep level tubes. Remember, by this point, almost everything included on the various lines were either cut and cover or open cutting, but this all changed with the city and South London railway line that opened in 1890. The line, which stretched from King William Street near Monument Station today to Stockwell in South London, measured 5.1 kilometers, and it was the first line to run underneath the River Thames. Two 3.1-meter circular tunnels were dug between King William Street and Elephant and Castle, with a slightly larger tunnel continuing to Stockwell. This was an important line for another reason, as it became not only the first in London to use electric trains, but the first anywhere in the world. The original plan to use cable cars was scrapped when the company producing them went bankrupt, and instead Instead, the line began using an electric system, with current supplied by a third rail beneath the small cramped carriages, which came to have the unfortunate nickname Padded Cells. The Waterloo and City Line opened in 1898 and linked Waterloo and Bank without any stops in between. That might sound like the world's most useless railway, but with huge numbers of people coming into the city from the south terminal of Waterloo and heading to the financial district around Bank, it certainly made sense and helps to explain why that line has the nickname The Drain. The Central London Railway, which forms part of the modern Central Line, opens in 1900 and ran from between Bank and Shepherd's Bush in the west, servicing a total of 13 stations along the way. Two tunnels were dug parallel to one another, 18 to 34 meters below ground, and ran for 9.14 kilometers. This was later extended from both ends and today runs for a total length of 74 kilometers. If creating deep tunnels had changed the landscape of the London Underground system, then their full electrification forever changed the experience. As I mentioned earlier, a trip on the early lines would certainly have got you from A to B quite quickly, but it was not an enjoyable journey. Often with poor ventilation, the early underground lines were an oppressive mixture of toxic smoke pouring from the locomotives and heat that during the summer could build up to deeply uncomfortable levels. One early passenger famously remarked that his journey had given him his first glimpse of Hades, the Greek god of death from the underworld. Things changed when electrification was added to the system in the early years of the 20th century. By this point, both the city and South London Railway and Central London Railway had begun using direct current, a DC system, with two conductor rails energized, one with a positive current and the other with a negative one. This was very much cutting edge technology at the time and probably worked well initially because these were relatively short lines. An agreement between the Metropolitan and District Lines in 1901 appeared to set the system on course to use an AC system with overhead wires, but after an American businessman invested in the district line, things switched to a DC system similar to what was already in operation on other lines. Both began using the new DC system in 1905, and I think it's fair to say that we haven't looked back since. The early years of the new century were some of the busiest in terms of construction that the city has ever seen. Lines were being extended in all directions, but the system itself was still very much fragmented. This was not so much a network as rather a series of separate companies often trying to outdo each other for profit while not passing up the opportunity to undercut their competition. While nationalization didn't occur until 1948, the establishment of the Underground Electric Railway Company of London in 1902 was the first effort to bring several lines under the same umbrella company. In its early days, it effectively controlled four lines, the Baker Street and Waterloo Railway, the Sharon Cross, Euston and Hampstead Railway, the Great Northern, Piccadilly and Brompton Railway, and the District Railway. Of course, no discussion regarding the London Underground system would be complete without discussing its most iconic image, the map. The tube map has become one of the most widely reproduced maps anywhere in the world, but its orderly lines and the close distances between stations are not quite what you'd see in real life. The problem was, how do you provide a map that is pleasing to the eye while also giving the relevant information? In the early days before it was an integrated system, there was no official map of all the separate railways. Each service would provide its own route maps, but it wasn't until 1921 that a complete map 
map appeared. But the station names were often squashed and difficult to read, while the chaotic lines were enough to eventually persuade you to just give up and walk. In 1931, an ex-railway employee, Harry Beck, completed his own version of the map, but his submission was initially rejected. Two years later, he gave it another go, and while alterations have occurred over time, our modern map is roughly the same as Beck's second attempt. He was said to have been paid £10, that's £650 today for the map at the time, and received zero royalties after that, even though it eventually became a global hit, selling millions of copies around the world. As the British found themselves at war in 1939, the London Underground system would go on to be used for a very different purpose than it had been designed for. When German bombers began hitting London in 1940, underground stations were soon being used as bomb shelters. During the day, train service would continue as normal, but by night, an estimated 130,000 Londoners would cram into the tube stations across the city. As the Blitz dragged on, amenities within the tunnels and stations greatly improved, with dinner and breakfast sometimes on offer. And just a quick fun fact for you, ex-talk show host Jerry Springer was born in Highgate Station on the Northern Line when his mother sought refuge during a bombing raid in 1944. But being in a tube station there was still no guarantee of safety. In March 1943, a panic in Bethnal Green Station led to 173 people dying in the single worst accident to occur on the underground system. As Britain and London began to slowly clamber back to their feet after World War II, it didn't take long until the idea of building additional underground lines was raised. The Victoria Line, which today stretches from Brixton in the south to Walthamstow in the northeast, was the first line that didn't have to follow the road system above. After some trial tunnelling in 1959, work began in 1963, and the new line finally opened in 1968. You might well know that the first driver to take a train along the line was none other than Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. It was said to be only her second ever ride on the underground at the age of 42. That might be surprising, but can you really imagine the Queen slogging through rush hour on the central line crammed below a sweaty armpit? Well, no, and me neither. The Jubilee Line, stretching from Stratford in the east to Stanmore in the west, was the second of the new lines to open in 1979. Technically, it's coloured silver to mark the Queen's Silver Jubilee, but really, it's, it's the grey line. <laughs> We probably take systems like these for granted today as they've become the norm in many large-scale cities, but when you take a step back and think about how many people, trains, and computer systems are working in conjunction, usually fairly smoothly, it's kind of mind-blowing. As any Londoner can attest, the system is far from perfect, but that often has more to do with the fact that they're using an underground railway first constructed over 150 years ago, rather than any overarching failings. And like many capital city dwellers, Londoners can be a fickle bunch, and it's not uncommon to see somebody rolling their eyes in annoyance because they need to wait six minutes. And first world problems and all that. If you've been following Mega Project since the early days, you might remember a video we did back in the day called The Crossworld Project, London's seemingly cursed new line which is going to bisect London. With most construction work now finished, it only seems now to be a matter of testing, but this saga has been dragging on for so long, I think many people have given up on trying to predict when it will be finished. But if you've enjoyed this video on London Underground and you're interested in what's coming next for London, why not give that a watch after this one? London's complex underground railway system really gets the plaudits it deserves. Too often people spend time moaning about delays and crammed conditions rather than appreciating the extraordinary ingenuity needed to build a system so complex which, generally speaking, works well most of the time. Modern cities would be incomprehensible without underground systems, and because of that, the London Underground has to be considered one of the most revolutionary transportation networks that the world has ever seen. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, you know what to do. Smash that like button below and don't forget to subscribe. Also check out today's glorious sponsor Squarespace who I'll link to below. And thank you for watching.